Today's readings come from Isaiah chapter 55 verses 1 to 13 and the Gospel of John chapter 1 verses 1 to 18. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire, and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy, and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree, instead of the briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to, te to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. All right. Good morning. Another thing God cannot do. Let's pray as we come to God's word and discover why that is good news. Let's pray. Gracious, heavenly and almighty God, thank you for your word. And as we come to it right now uh, and seek to understand it, seek to live in the light of your grace, seek to go deeper in our understanding and love for Jesus, may your Holy Spirit be at work helping us do just that. And we pray this for your glory. Amen. Well, the thing that God cannot do that we're thinking about today is... God cannot lie. It's another way of saying, whenever God speaks, it's true. He cannot lie. Now, 
This is an interesting question to ask today, isn't it? What is truth? I mean, we have lots of buzzwords at the moment. Misinformation, fake news, the trust that we have in certain institutions that we looked for for the truth has been eroded. The rug feels like in some way that it's being pulled out from under us. What is truth? How do we... In, in a world that is flooded with information today because of the internet, we, it's like a jungle that we need to weave through to actually get to the truth. I came across this story a little earlier this year and I locked it away for today. Uh, there was a man who created a fake restaurant and it became the number one restaurant in London. Uh, in 2017, a journalist for an online uh, media channel called Vice created a fake TripAdvisor account for a non-existent restaurant simply named The Shed at Dulwich. He then got an, uh, an entourage of his friends to post positive TripAdvisor reviews of said venue uh, and the, the Shed's notoriety went through the roof. It skyrocketed in, in the London foodie scene. Uh, the journalist, whose name is Uber Butler, right, decided to use his very own garden shed as the setting for his five-star restaurant. He purchased a burner phone, a, a, just a, you know, a phone that wasn't his regular phone, uh, just for this purpose, to handle inquiries with, uh, and before buying a domain and building a website to make, make the venue look legit. Uh, and Uber, the journalist, uh, says this, and I, I love what he says. Right? He says, hot spots are all about quirks. So to cut through the noise, I need a concept silly enough to infuriate your dad. A concept like naming all of our dishes after moods. After photographing some Michelin star style uh, taster menu items, such as what you see up there, or for you and me, here are the ingredients he used. All right, combination of shaving foam, bleach tablets and honey. The shed at Dulwich was born and hype began to grow with requests from journalists for bookings flooding in. So much that Uber, Uber, if that's how you pronounce it, had to give his audience what they wanted and he invited them for a one-off evening at the shed where he served them microwave lasagna. What? We are easily duped. It's, it's incredible. We live in a world that is a jungle of lies. We live in a world where we create truth for ourselves. All our troubles in this world effectively began with a lie, didn't it? Just, it was just an outworking of the fall where we bought into the lie that uh, we can be like God. We can decide what is true and what is not. We can decide what is right and what is wrong. And we can do that for ourselves. Don't need, oops, don't need God. The problem with that is we didn't create this world. We didn't create ourselves. We didn't create reality. If there is no truth outside of us, if we cannot agree on an absolute objective authority that determines what is true and what is not, then we're going to run into all sorts of problems. Because fundamentally, if truth is something that I make up for me, then who are you to say what I believe is not true? Right? We are sleeping in the bed here in 21st century Australia that we have made for ourselves. I mean, we, we, we lament at the way society is fractured and seems to be fracturing more. And it's because each tribe only looks within themselves for truth and then thinks my truth trumps your truth. And the mental gymnastics that people perform today because uh, the belief that they shout doesn't line up with the life that they live. And the, the, the most classic example today is the idea of tolerance. 
Right? We're told, oh, we're tolerant. You know, we, we, we respect everyone and their beliefs and their ideas unless my truth doesn't conform to yours. How do we navigate this jungle? Where do we go for truth? Well, here's the good news for today. God cannot lie. That's the machete we need to cut through the jungle of lies. God cannot lie. Another way of saying God always speaks the truth. Another way of saying God is the truth. And that his word is something we can trust unreservedly, completely. Creation conforms to God's word. It's not the other way around. Now this is just, if you haven't switched your brains on, which I'm sure most of you have, this is a really meaty thing to think about. So listen closely. God speaks, then creation cannot but submit to his word. God says, let there be light. Creation answers, your will is my command. God is fundamentally and categorically different from you and me. He's the creator. Everything else, including you and me, is created. And when we speak, our words are true only if they conform to reality. When God speaks, his words are true because he is the arbiter of what is true. Because he is the truth. So his words are true, not because they conform to reality, but because reality conforms to his word. Right? Hold on a second, some of you might be saying. My, my brain went here, but maybe you're going there now. So if God decided that blue is suddenly red and that torturing and killing puppies is perfectly fine, so be it. Right? This is an old philosophical dilemma it's stated like this. Is the good good because God wills it? Or does God will the good because it's good? In other words, is there something, some standard outside of God that he must conform to? Or does God simply decide what is good on a whim? And the problem with this dilemma is that it's what's called a false dichotomy. It, it, it pits one thing against the other that shouldn't be pitted against each other. It's not that black and white. And Nick Tucker, in his book that I've uh, been quoting through this series, uh, says this rather helpfully. He says, We must say that both are simultaneously true, but only when held together. God wills the good and truth because it is good and it's true. And it is good and true because God wills it. This is because God's own being is the definition of good. He is the yardstick to which every claim of goodness and truth is measured. He cannot even be tempted to, to do evil, which was last week, remember, because his own goodness prevents it. He cannot lie because he is the truth. And so everything he does is in accordance with the truth and all that is true derives from him. All right, all right. Big concepts, big things. Let's bring it down. Let's come to Isaiah chapter 55. A series of invitations to come and hear and see and seek. And it's to seek the God whose word achieves the purpose for which he sent it. To come and seek the God who cannot lie. To put your hope in him, the God who is truth. So our three uh, points for today. I know the introduction was a little bit long, but... The points aren't going to be as long. Uh, so come taste the truth that God cannot lie. Come see the truth that God cannot lie. And come hope in the truth. Taste, see, hope. Come taste the truth. Verse 1, that invitation. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. Thirsty for what? Isaiah prophesies uh, at a time when the people of God were saturating themselves in lies. Right? Worshipping false gods from the nations around them. Kind of hedging their bets in a way. Oh, we, we, we still worship Yahweh, but we're going to you know, do some Baal worship over here too. 
Right? You, here's the thing, though. You dilute the truth. You don't get a half-truth. There's no such thing. It's a lie. Despite what the people are drinking, they are still thirsty. Thirsty for what? The truth that is only found in the Lord, the one true God of all creation. Come, you who have no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. I mean, what is more satisfying than good food? Good free food. Verse 2, why spend money on what is not bread, labor on what does not satisfy? See, the people of God are looking in all the wrong places for something. Not only that, they're foregoing something that is free and real to pay for something that is not free and isn't real. That's the absurdity that Isaiah is tapping into. Right, he, 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 he touches on this earlier in, in earlier chapters in, in like Isaiah 45 and 46 where he, he you know, the Lord partakes of his favorite pastime and uh, pointing out how silly it is to worship idols. And he says, you know, you cut down a tree, you, uh, you use half the wood to burn a fire and you use the, uh, to cook your meal and you use half the other half of the wood to make a statue and bow down to it. And it's absurd. It's a lie. In verse 2, the Lord begins to drop the metaphor because, of course, he's not really talking about food and drink. And he begins to reveal what he's really talking about. And it says, listen, listen to me. And the Hebrew really does repeat itself there. And it doesn't repeat itself without reason. Really tune in. Your soul will delight. What I am offering is the real deal, soul-satisfying truth. In verse 3, give, literally, like stretch your ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. The Lord wants the people to come and taste something our souls will delight in, find deepest satisfaction in, something we will need to hear so that our souls may live. And what is that? It's the next thing he says. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. What's uh, that referring to? It's referring to the covenant promise that God made with David, David that you can read about in 2 Samuel chapter 7. A son forever on the throne. A son of David forever on the throne. This is the promise of the coming Messiah. It's an everlasting covenant. No expiration date. An expression of God's faithful love. And this promise is the soul-satisfying food that the Lord wants his people to come and taste. Why is it so deeply soul-satisfying to know the promises of God? Because he cannot lie. You can trust his word unreservedly, utterly, completely. Come and taste what is free. Why are you spending your money on what is not bread when the real bread is right before you? Why do we look for soul satisfaction in things that don't satisfy? Why do we look for salvation in things that cannot save? Why do we look for truth in things that really are just lies? The prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah, in reflecting on the the people of God, says this in chapter 2, verse 13. He says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. They've got living water and they've got toilet water. And the toilet can't even hold the water. Augustine said it like this, You have made us for yourself, and our souls are restless until they find their rest in you. It's one of my favourite quotes uh, from theologians through all of history. And you've probably heard me say it before. And you will hear me say it again. And what Isaiah and Augustine are getting at is the truth that in our hearts we have a hole that has a particular shape 
And what we are often doing is we're trying to fill that hole with things that just don't fit. Like trying to jam a jigsaw puzzle piece into a place where it's not meant to go. And what is that? That's unsatisfying. It doesn't quench the thirst. It doesn't satisfy the hunger. That hole that we have only has one piece that will fit it perfectly. It's a God-shaped hole that God must fill if our souls are to know the true rest that they should know. Augustine's point in Isaiah in, in chapter 55 is that our souls will only truly know satisfaction and rest in the Lord. Now, I don't need to rattle off all the different places we turn to for truth instead of God. All the bread we spend money on that isn't really bread. Because you know what that is. Do you know how you know that you know? Because they don't satisfy. Your soul is still restless. So come taste the truth. When you taste something exquisite, an incredible chocolate cake or a tender, juicy steak, a refreshing cold glass of water on a hot summer's day, what do you want? More. It's getting someone to taste uh, in the first place that is the biggest hurdle. Trying to introduce something to your three-year-old child that, that you know that they will like. If you're a parent, you've had that battle. I know you will like this. Just open your mouth. In many cases, God in his grace had to shove the truth of the gospel down our throats because we refused to open our mouths like a toddler when uh, he, uh, like a toddler. And when he did, how did you respond? Wow, that's good. <laughs> I would like more of that, please. We know that our world is drenched in lies. We find it hard to accept when someone claims to know the truth. I mean, I saw this, uh, someone made this comment to me, I uh, saw it online the other day. You ever notice how when you lose the TV remote at home, you instantly lose trust in everyone in the house? Are you sitting on the remote? No. Really? Stand up. <laughs> Our world is drenched in lies, so the offer isn't just come and taste the truth. It's come and see the truth. This is the next point. The Lord uh, wants us to come and see the truth. Come and hear the promise he made. Verse 3, you know, an everlasting covenant. The promise to David. The promise is a him. It's a person. Verse 4, see, I have made him a witness to the peoples. A witness of what? God's faithful love. And when he comes, what will happen? Verse 5, you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you. The promise isn't just for Israel. Right? The covenant promise that Isaiah is talking about here is effectively the next layer of God's promise to Abraham, that through a seed of Abraham, blessing would flow out to the world. How? Verse 5, because the Lord, you, your God, he's going to do it. Therefore, verse 6, seek the Lord, call on him. He alone can save you. Verse 7, repent and believe. Turn to the Lord because he will freely pardon. Freely, without cost to you. But it cost him. That's how he will do it. We know because we live we know this because we live on the other side of seeing this promise come true. The promised Messiah Jesus died for you and me. He paid the cost so we can be freely pardoned. He was pierced for our transgressions. Hmm, Isaiah said that somewhere just a little bit earlier. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace fell on him. By his wounds we are healed. Come and see the truth because the truth became something you can see. The God who cannot lie kept his word. And that truth took on flesh and blood. And he has a name, Jesus. The truth is Jesus. 
We read about it. John chapter 1, the word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus goes on to announce that the truth will set you free. He wasn't talking about an abstract concept. He was talking about himself. Because a little bit later in John's gospel, what does he say? I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. You want to know the truth? You come, you taste and you see it all in Jesus. He is the truth in our life that helps us navigate the jungle of lies that without him we're lost. The truth came and walked and talked and died and rose again for you. Why? Because God cannot lie. Jesus is the hope we need to come back to again and again. And this is the final point, hope in the truth. The truth is satisfying for your soul. Why? Because it brings life. When we come to verse 8, Uh, In Isaiah 55, it's almost as if the Lord was thinking about going on to explain more about his everlasting covenant with David uh, and how that's going to be be fulfilled. And then he says, nah, you know what? I'm not sure you'll get it. I don't think you will understand. You just have to trust me because I am God and I don't lie. Verses 8 and 9, those Rather well-known verses. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And the gospel plays that out. Because not in a million years would Israel have dreamed up a plan like God. I mean, Isaiah is perhaps the book in the Old Testament that lays it out more plainly than any other book. Isaiah chapter 7. Uh, A virgin will be with child and you shall call him Emmanuel. Uh, uh, Chapter 9, you know, a child will be born. He'll be mighty God. Everlasting father, prince of uh, of peace. Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our transgressions. That God himself would come in the flesh, born as a human baby, grow as a human boy, live as a human man, die like a human criminal, and then rise from the grave victorious over sin, death, and evil. That that plan was incredible. No one knew, no one understood that that's what God was going to do. Because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And what does Jesus bring? What does the truth that God cannot lie bring? It brings life. He brings life. That's the picture in Isaiah 55, verses 10 to 13. It's a picture of new creation. Rain watering the earth. We've just had a wonderful illustration of that over the last couple of days. And bringing forth new life. The mountains, the hills, the trees, they burst into songs of joy and they're clapping their hands. And in the middle of this, What is bringing this life? Verse 11, my word that goes out from my mouth. My word is life. The Lord speaks and creation says, your will is my command. It will not return to me empty. It will always achieve the purpose for which I send it. Our words come back empty all the time. Parents know that perhaps better than anyone. Now I can say, let the room be clean. And unless someone gets up and cleans it, nothing is going to happen. You know, I'd love to be able to say, let there be steak for dinner. And woof, there it is on the table. But for that word to become true, someone's got to cook the steak. We can go blue in the face and nothing will happen. For our words to achieve anything, they must be backed up by action. But when God speaks... You know, you know, when God says, let there be light, he's not waiting for someone to flick on the light switch. Light just happens. God's life-bringing word will always achieve the purpose for which he sends it. And why did he send it? To bring life. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, and you have been made alive now in Christ Jesus. 
God's word achieved the purpose for which he sent it. To bring life, eternal life to those who repent and believe. And what does uh, Jesus say eternal life is in John's gospel, chapter 17? It, it is to know God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. To know the God who cannot lie. The God who in Jesus declared, I am the way, the truth and the life. So come hope in the truth that God is a God who cannot lie. For he has said he will heal our world broken by lies. God is that constant in our life. That foundation of truth that we have to navigate the jungle. And we navigate that in the public space and in our private lives. You know, uh, just another example of how we're having to navigate a world of lies. Uh, in Victoria at the moment, there is a, a Liberal MP whose name is Moira Deeming. Uh, she's a godly, faithful woman who's a part of a Presbyterian church down there. Uh, she was recently elected uh, uh, to the, the Senate in, in, uh, uh, representing the Liberal Party. Uh, she only gave her maiden speech back in February. Uh, and uh, a week ago, she attended and spoke at an event called Let Women Speak, organised by a group called Standing for Women, uh, that advocates for the reinstatement of reasonable biological sex-based rights and against the irreversible and harmful medical transitioning practices used on gender non-conforming autistic and gay minors. Now, this event that she went to uh, was organised by someone called Angela Jones, a left-wing pro-gay rights Jewish woman. Now that's an important detail because what happened is a bunch of neo-Nazi men dressed in black and covered in masks were somehow let through by the buffer zone that was set up by the police. Uh, they crashed the event. And in a knee-jerk reaction, the leader of the opposition, John Pasudo, the liberal leader in Victoria, announced he will move a motion to expel Moira uh, from the party room. And we're going to find out the result of that tomorrow. Why? Because in his words, he seeks to expel Moira for organising, promoting and attending an anti-trans rights rally uh, headlined by an activist known to be publicly associated with far-right uh, extremist groups. Cue the media. Headlines like, Liberal MP faces expulsion after seeking, speaking at anti-trans rally attended by neo-Nazis. It's a lie. It's twisted. It's malicious. She's described as a rogue and a controversial MP. Right? A guy that I know uh, wonderfully summed it up like this. So let's get this straight, he says. A group of women legally gathered to speak about women's rights in Australia. That gathering was crashed by a group of males. Politicians and the media are now refusing to listen to that group of women. Ironic, no. Instead, they are insisting that the group of males represent and speak for those women. And to make matters worse, the women are now being held responsible for the actions of the men. Let women speak, indeed. It's a jungle out there. And we need uh, uh, <laughs> that foundation. We need that anchor. In our daily lives, we face a jungle of lives. We, we're constantly bombarded with... Uh, and trying to figure out what's true, you know, what's right, what's wrong, uh, issues to do with body image, lies from our boss, lies, students, possibly from your teachers, who might try to tell you that God isn't real or something. Lies from friends and family, but perhaps most of all, lies we tell ourselves. I am not loved. I'm hopeless. I'm worthless. I'm disgusting, I'm beyond saving. Jesus says to all that, no, 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 and no. Let this truth sink into your bones. God cannot lie. Jesus is the lifeblood that pumps through that truth. God cannot lie. Jesus is the exclamation point on the end of that truth. God cannot lie. Jesus is the underlining of that truth. God cannot lie. And Hebrews 6 uh, the truth that God cannot lie is described as like an anchor for your soul. Right? We have this hope for an anchor, uh, firm and secure. And God has made an unchangeable, unshakable promise that we can build our lives on. When do you feel an anchor the most? 
in calm waters or stormy waters? It's in storms, isn't it? Well, we're in a storm. And the waves of life are strongly pulling at us, trying to drag us away in all sorts of ways, with all sorts of lies. But we have an anchor. Feel the tension on it. If every other certainty in your life collapses, you have an anchor for your soul, an anchor that will never give way. Not even death can pull you free from that. Because the anchor is firmly fixed in the God who cannot lie. When God says, be strong and courageous, do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God cannot lie. When God says, though your sins be red as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. God cannot lie. When God says his unfailing love endures forever, say it with me. God cannot lie. When Jesus says, go and make disciples and surely I am with you always, God cannot lie. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, he who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. When he says, I am the good shepherd and no one can snatch uh, my sheep out of my hand. When he says, I am the resurrection and the life and whoever believes in me will never die. When he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And if you've seen me, you've seen the father. When he says from the cross, it is finished, God cannot lie. When Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You will find rest for your souls. God cannot lie. So as you seek to navigate the jungle, when you doubt God's love, his care, his promises, when you hear the lies whispered in your ears, look to Jesus. Speak those three words to your heart and know the deep soul, life-giving delight and satisfaction that comes from this truth. God cannot lie. Let's pray. Gracious, almighty and heavenly Father, what a comfort it is to know that you are the God of truth. That you cannot lie. And so your word is utterly dependable. Your promises will assuredly come about. You are the faithful God. And you have proven that in the way that you came to save us. In Jesus. So Lord, as we navigate our lives, as we navigate the jungle of lies, help us to remember that truth. To remember it as an anchor for our souls. That you are the God of truth. The God who cannot lie. And we praise you and thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.